Hello, I'm Ben Wan, and today I'm going to be talking about cosmology with the Sunyab Zeldovich effect. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about how to determine uh, thermodynamics of galaxy clusters. Uh, my advisor for this research is Dr. Michael Zemkov. So to begin, I'm first going to explain what the sunyav zeldovich effect is, then I'm going to get into what instruments we're using for these measurements, and then talk about some problems that crop up before I move on to the analysis, and then finally I'm going to end with future work. Um, so there is this thing called the cosmic microwave background and it's all encompassing all around us and you can take a radio telescope and point it anywhere in the sky and you'll get a signal from this thing and so uh that's what's pictured here on the left and it's this weird ovular shape because it's supposed to be dem demonstrating that you can see the entire sky on the right is a, a galaxy cluster called Maxia 717, and this is a Hubble field of that galaxy cluster. And in these galaxy clusters, there's this hot, diffuse gas um, that's at tens of millions of Kelvin. And what happens is light from the cosmic microwave background travels through the universe and through our galaxy cluster, and then it interacts with electrons in this very hot, diffuse gas. And these electrons sorry sorry these this light gains energy from the electrons and that creates a spectrum and that spectrum is the sunyov zeldovich effect and it's shown here in the red is the normal sunyov zeldovich effect but then there's also this relativistic correction that's shown in the purple and the relativistic correction is actually what we're interested in measuring and that comes from the fact that these clusters have an atmosphere that's so extremely hot that just the relativistic correction needs to be applied. And so um, the temperatures for this correction are denoted in kilo electron volts, as we can see in the key. But uh, to give a reference for how hot that actually is, 5 keV is approximately four times the temperature at the center of the sun. So pretty hot. And there's actually two uh, parameters that we can kind of tweak to change the shape of the spectrum. And one is called the Compton Y parameter, which sounds scary, but really it's just proportional to how much energy the light is gaining from interacting with these electrons. And then the other is the temperature of the electrons themselves. So, uh, that's the program and our goal is to measure the temperature by measuring this correction. Um, so what instruments do we actually use to do that? We use an instrument on the Herschel Space Observatory pictured here on the left called SPIRE. SPIRE has a photometer that has three different uh, frequencies that it looks at. One is uh, 600 gigahertz, another is 850 gigahertz, and the last one is 1200 gigahertz. And then on the right here is the Caltech submillimeter, the Caltech submillimeter observatory, and that has an instrument called BoloCam that observes at 140 gigahertz. And so a major problem that we have to deal with is dust contamination. Um, so on the left again is the same Hubble field, but zoomed in on the center of the galaxy cluster Max J717. And on the right is the galaxy cluster Max J717, but in a spire field. So in the spire image, there's something interesting going on here in that it's actually a composite image. So Blue represents 1200 gigahertz, green represents 850 gigahertz, and red represents 600 gigahertz. Um, and these small blobs we can see here are the galaxies that we can see kind of here. And so what's going on is as there is also this huge red blob here, and that's the Sunyov Zelovich effect. And we can't see that 
in the Hubble field because they're at completely different frequencies and it's not present there. I suppose what's going on is galaxies in front of and galaxies behind uh, the galaxy cluster are getting are getting in the way. The galaxies behind are actually getting gravitationally lensed so that they appear in front of the cluster and that contaminates the signal. And so that's what I mean by dust contamination here in this context is that these galaxies are overshadowing the signal at the senior Zeldovich effect and it's very hard to pick out. And that's a problem that we have to deal with and we have to be very careful about dealing with it because when we're subtracting off the the information of the galaxy, we can also accidentally subtract off some of the signal from the actual signal, the actual effect of the signal of the leverage effect. And so we don't want to do that because that can change our results quite drastically. Um, and then so that's like the biggest challenge with this. Um, so moving on to the actual analysis and how we take that information we saw on the right and go from that to a temperature and a constant y parameter, that's what I'm going to talk about here. So to begin, we have our raw data. On the left, we have below cam at 140 gigahertz. And that huge black blob is the senior of the Zilovich effect. And on the right is the spiral bands. And so each of these white little blobs in the spiral images, those are galaxies. And one important thing to note is this is for different galaxy clusters for RJ1347, and we can't see the sunyav zeldovich effect in this cluster. And that's because it's, one, extremely faint, and two, getting overshadowed by all of these other galaxies. And so we can't pick it out by eye. And it's even very hard for a computer to pick it out without getting rid of these sources. So the next step is to get rid of all of these white blobs that are overshadowing it and blocking everything out. And so to do that, we use a program called PCAM. In the upper right of this slide, what we see is two images. One is of a simulation with a bunch of point sources in it. That's what these white, white little blobs are. These are galaxies. And what also in this in this simulation there's some noise added and which is just small little fluctuations here and there and then the SZ signal is also added in and the way PCAT works is you feed it this image on the left with all these point sources and what it does is it takes an empty image and it populates it with a bunch of random point sources and it looks at that image and it compares it to the image that we're seeing here and it says does this match and it keeps adding and removing sources until it matches. And there's some, there's some, you know, fail safes in there to be like, okay, well, don't take a bunch of very small dim galaxies and add like five million of them together. And that that makes like this bright one we see here. There's there's obviously that's not physical, <laughs> and so that's something that's built into. The, uh, the blending software is what it's called. Um, and what that gives us is it gives us a model of these point sources. And we can subtract that from this image and that gives us what's on the right here, uh, which is uh, supposedly just the noise and the SE effect. Um, for our preliminary results, we also added in an additional thing for PCAT where we actually used PCAT to fit for the amplitude of the Z effect. And that's what uh, these, this corner plot represents here. So up here is the amplitude at 1200 gigahertz, 850 gigahertz, and 600 gigahertz. And these are all in units of megajansky per radian. And that's what we're using to fit. So we have our already calculated value from Bolocam, and then we have the free spire bands that we, the free uh, amplitudes of the Z that we calculated with PCAT right here. And what we do is we're using a grid search to fit for the spectrum. So we take a grid of Y values and a grid of T values. 
T being the temperature. And we compute the spectrum, that the theoretical spectrum that we should see for each of those parameters at that point in the grid. And what we are left with is a grid of spectrums. And we take that grid and we compare it to these data points and we say, okay, do these data points match the grid? And what that allows us to do is we come up with a statistic for what the best fitting one is and what the most likely one is. And that's what this plot is here on the bottom left. Is it's a contour plot of the most probable y and t values. And so x is actually the best y and t value. And then the uh, white triangle is just a result from prior paper. And so one thing that the Institute Observer might notice is, hey, you just said you matched the spectrums with the black dots here, but these don't seem matched. I mean, this is kind of below the uh, line, and this is above it, and then this is way above it. So what's going on there? So uh, one thing to point out is this is, again, a preliminary result, and we're not quite sure that we're modeling uh, some components of the dust correctly. Specifically, there's dust from other sources that is kind of getting in the way. And so moving on to what that entails for future work is, one thing we want to do is we are going to take these uh, this data from Planck. And we're going to use that data to kind of come up with an idea of what it should look like what the dust should look like at our spiral wavelengths. And hopefully that helps inform uh, PCAT and we can get much better results for those data points. The other thing we want to do is, getting our simula is get our simulations working. And so the simulations are, we make up our own map of point sources and we add in noise and we add in NC signal as I showed on the slide with the PCAT. And what we do is we know what the amplitude of the SZ effect is for the simulations. So we run that through our analysis and all we get is an amplitude. And we say, okay, how close is this? What's going on? And that kind of gives us a way to measure how well we're doing with our analysis. And then finally, we want to move on from doing just the analysis on the one cluster I showed here, but to give our full sample of all 24 galaxy clusters. That's all. Thank you.